So, any codec moments from you, Snake? Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Codec Moments. I'm Ephraim Scufflegrit, joined here again with Flash. <laughs> Flash on uh, keyboards. Oh, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> so how are you doing today, sir? Yeah, very good, very good. Just home from work. And plenty to do, but nothing crazy, so I'm doing well. I was just about to do my daily ritual of picking up some FOB, but um, no, we'll do this first. Right on, sounds good to me. And speaking of FOB, we recently had an update, huh? Yeah, we did. It wasn't the update we thought we were getting. It's weird because these are always published like a week after uh, we record them, so who knows? Yeah, the next one might be up by now, but maybe it's just my fault, but I was hearing all the stuff I've got coming soon, and then the update will be coming on Tuesday, my Tuesday. It's just like, oh, here's the new event you've all been waiting for, and I'm like, where, where am I where are my cameras? I, I want to throw cameras everywhere, and it wasn't there. So <laughs> that was a shame. But um, it's a neat little event. Have you tried it out? I have not. I actually loaned out my game uh, too, right. too long ago now, but I'm getting it back tomorrow, and I'm, uh, the reason I asked for it back was because I knew that there was the FOB update, and I also thought it was going to be the custom placeable cameras and the mines and all that fun stuff, which I think is like something that a lot of people said they were disappointed wasn't in the game at first. Oh, yeah, me too. We've seen a bit of a video of how that works. They've also talked about colors and, and camouflage. I, I don't know what that might mean. I mean, best case, unrealistic scenario is like, I don't know, give camouflage to your guards and, and maybe new colors for painting your FOB. Average case scenario, I, I couldn't even imagine how lame it would be. It's probably just new FOB colors or something. But, yeah, when the um, cameras were announced, that really made me start going back to FOB mode and going, shit, I want to set my game up here, or I want to level up my unit and do all this stuff. And it's been keeping me going for a while. The new event's interesting. If no one's played it, it's um, the four platforms, and each platform has, like, a handful of guards on it and riot suits. So it kind of forces you to mix it up a little bit. And there are prisoners scattered around the struts. Now, I've gotten a few of them, but they don't seem to be particularly good. So I don't know what the real point is of getting them, especially when... Um, Oh, you get five S rank guys just for completing a platform anyway, so um, the prisoners aren't that great. And this does not have, like, because I mean, I haven't played it myself, obviously. This is not the one with the skulls in it. No, I thought it would be. Like, the event's called Bound Dragons, and I went onto the first strut, and it was fucking empty. I'm like, oh, God, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. <laughs> and then, uh, nothing happened. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting to me that, like, they're really. Like, I mean, the game came out September 1st, and, like, now there's all these, like, big, huge things coming to the FOB update. Do you think that these were plans from the beginning to kind of, like, do it staggered like this, or maybe this was stuff that, like, didn't quite make it for release day that they were kind of, like, planning on putting in there? I'd say a bit of column A, a bit of column B. That's fair. I yeah, think, I can like, definitely see that. Like, placeable cameras, you know, it seems like a no-brainer, and it's kind of what people were hoping for, but it might not have made the final cut for whatever reason. But a lot of the stuff just seems like... We talked about it last time, didn't we? Uh, adding content to the end game to kind of keep people at the top, give them things to do, things to spend your GMP on, more reasons to keep playing other than, well, this is kind of fun, but it's nice when you have goals, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, speaking of goals, there's a big one going on since we now know 100% how to get to the nuclear disarmament. Yeah, that's right. It seems the part they are waiting for is nuclear pl proliferation first. And... Um, which makes sense to me. I was thinking about it this afternoon, actually. Like, they need a really good number for of nukes for there to be. Otherwise, disarming it wouldn't mean anything. Because if it was just, like, have nukes and then go to no nukes, like, the first person who built a nuke and disposed it would, like, trigger both things. So they've got a, a number that we seem to have had to have reached. And that once we reach that number, they announced this event is ready to go. And then all we have to do is get rid of them all again. And seems harder than, I guess, people thought it would be at first. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm having a hard time believing we're ever going to get there, especially with the, the phantom nukes and stuff. What I do find interesting is that we didn't get the nuclear world cutscene that, would, you know, supposedly mm. we figured was going to come first, of course, because, you know, it's kind of like a mirror image of the peace uh, cutscene or the disarmament cutscene where instead of, you know, like, oh, you know, no one has nukes now, Kaz is up there and like, oh, we we done fucked up. Our plan put nukes all <laughs> over the world. <laughs> yeah, I wonder about that. I, I was the same as you. I thought once we hit that first milestone, that scene would show up. Um, it's possible it's the other way around. Once we get disarmament and if the number of nukes climbs back up to that proliferation level, then... Um, <laughs> then that scene will play as a cue that we can go for disarmament again or something like that. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I mean, oh, I they're... saw uh, Peeler tweeted about, 
or it might have been him or somebody else, about the, the cutscene can be unlocked many times, I think is what he was driving at. If you go up and down and up and down and up and down, it will, it will keep cycling, uh, seem to be what they were saying. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if we like how many nukes you would need to get up to the to the like. I, I guess it would just be the opposite. Just every person or every yeah. FOB on the server would have a nuke. That's crazy. Um, it'd be funny if that was true. <laughs> it probably isn't. But I'd say whatever number it was that tipped it over to unlock disarmament, going back to that number would probably get the cutscene if I had to make a call. Right on. Right on. Are you so on, ha- like a particular side of you know? Do you think we're gonna reach it or you know? Are I'm. A, Assuming you're going out there and disarming nukes because you're on FOB so much. I am. Well, I'm trying. Um, I haven't quite got the dedication that some do because you've got to sit there for an hour um, refreshing your nuclear list if you want to get someone now because everyone's trying to do it. So, A, that's cool that everyone's doing it, but B, it, it kind of makes it harder to do it at the same time. But, yeah, I've been going for I want to get my 10. I haven't, I haven't even got 10. I think I've got 7. When I first... Uh, what, what, oh, what first got me back into FOB was, like, oh, shit, I want... I want to get my name on this this cutscene when it plays for everyone who's contributed to disarmament, and I realised that I wasn't really up to scratch with um, my invasions at all. So I started from the start, started doing training, started um, infiltrating low level FOBs, and built my skills up. And now I'm I've got a pretty consistent invasion record, and I can get a nuke when I feel like it, or when I'm able to. So yeah, I'm going for it. I, I check in on our philanthropy a bit just to see how it's going, but there's not much to say, really. It's, it's a neat idea that they've started subreddits in communities, but there really isn't much to talk about. It's get out there, steal nukes, disarm them, and swap strategies, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, like, even before I, uh, like, when I gave my game away, you know, the uh, the tweets and the, the countdown hadn't begun yet, but even then it was starting to become a little bit difficult. Like, I think one time I had to wait, like, 20, 25 minutes you know, to find a nuke, and that was when I was trying to get rid of Demon Snake, because I had grown tired of just watching him be bloody all the time, and hadn't figured out the mm. White Mamba trick yet, so that's what got me into FOB a lot more, was, oh, right, I gotta get all these fucking nukes so I can get rid of this damn blood all over the place. <laughs> yeah, uh, just a shout out, I see uh, Chia mentioned that Poetic Poet has got 100 nukes down, um, that is crazy, but it's also des- dedicated, um, nice work on anyone who's managed to sink 100 nukes, that's pretty cool. Holy shit, well um, done, Poetic Poet. Yeah, and interesting what you said about Demon Snake too, um, because I'm still recording my playthrough, but I haven't found time to start my audio from scratch now that I've got a better mic. Uh, where was I with that? Yeah, I'd got my nuke really early, thinking, well, the, the quicker I do it, the quicker I can get rid of it. And Sorry, my nuke, my Demon Snake, but I didn't even get to Demon Snake. I just got the long horn, and I've oh, wow. just noticed... I just noticed uh, a few nights ago that the horn's gone back to normal, so in my playthrough, there's going to be a a switch of snake just randomly shrinking his horn in between, like, um, part one and part two or something like that. So, yeah, I'm back to normal snake, which is kind of cool. Right on. Yeah, when I uh, when I went to the longhorn snake, like, I was just gearing up to do my nuke, too, because I was reaching the end of uh, the S-Ranks and the objectives, and oh, I kind of let myself get sloppy a little bit. And then... You did. You're, you're a demon, Scuff. You're a demon. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It didn't happen to me, and I am the best of us. Um, <laughs> I know, so I never grinded for it, which is kind of nice. And one thing it did is kept me on my toes when I was screwing around a bit. Like, I've had a lot of fun just messing around and being a dick. But even then, knowing that I wanted to get rid of my horn kind of kept me a, a little aware of what I was doing and maybe not going for every single kill that I had to, which, which was interesting. Yeah, I remember you asking me... Uh... I think, like, right after we played Phantom Pain, was like, was there a moment where you just kind of, like, threw caution to the wind and just kind of started killing people left and right? Which surprises me that you never actually reached Demon Snake, like, after reaching that point and building your nuke. Yeah, I suppose so. Ugh. Yeah, tough call. I guess I was still getting a lot of heroism for doing general stuff, you know, getting all the animals and doing all that. And you really don't get punished a lot just for killing people. Like, even though I was murdering, I was still doing a pretty stealthy run where I could just nice clean headshots or choke outs or whatever but just not being afraid to kill someone I had to which is different from just like going mental and just burning everybody down every time I saw someone I suppose yeah right on right on yeah yeah so that, that's FOB mode and hopefully we get our we get our updates soon and speaking of news and all that fun stuff going on with Metal Gear, the uh, the Game Awards happened. The Game Awards happened. Um, I wasn't really paying attention. Like I saw lots of, we'll call it, general insanity about 
oh, it's happening, and Kiefer Southern will be there, and they're going to tell us about everything. And I, I wasn't really that interested, but I thought I'd pay attention. In the end, it was you guys in the chat room were basically narrating what was going on, and um, I couldn't quite believe some of it when I was reading it, so I had to go and check it out when I got home. Um, that was an interesting evening, wasn't it? Yeah, to say the least. I mean, I wasn't really expecting any, you know, like, big reveal. You know, Kojima comes marching out on stage carried by goddesses, you know, and flames go up all over the place, and he announces Chapter wow, 3. I, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting any big reveal like that. I was, you know, really interested to see, you know, what Phantom Pain would take home, and, you know, when the big moment mm. came up, like, I think the big surprise was, you know, after Kiefer Sutherland's amazing acceptance speech that Kojima wasn't there. Well, yeah, or he was... And wasn't allowed to wasn't allowed to go and collect his award, which is well, there's nothing to be said anymore about that. It's really, really disappointing. Yeah, that was Oh yeah, sorry if um someone's calling me out for saying I thought there was a ruse going on. I did. <laughs> um when I watched the video and the chief going, Well, Kojima can't be here, I'm like, Oh, that's BS. Like nobody in their right mind would actually send a lawyer and tell Hale Kojima he couldn't click the award. So I'm like, oh, yeah, there'll be something coming later on, blah, 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 blah. But nah, that was it. As yeah, soon as I heard him, the <laughs> next, next sentence, I was like, you could hear the dejection in his voice, and I was like, oh, my God, this is real. <laughs> this is actually, and, like, I've always been on, like, kind of the side of caution about, like, oh, you know, I don't know everything about every situation, you know, like, maybe Konami has some kind of, you know, like, point here. But, like, with this, I was just, like, I was surprised, like, what, Really? That's so disappointing. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, both of us, is, over the, what, years, there's been a lot of shit being flung around, and the vast majority of it really has just been speculation. People going, oh, well, Konami doing this and doing that, and did they take Kojima's name off because they're being mean-spirited and all this other stuff, and I'm like, that's, that's a weird conclusion to draw unless you're a standard video game drama junkie, but, I mean, this is what happened here. This is straight up and down bullshit. It's just... Um, terrible, terrible behavior, and there's no real excuse for it. I, to me, it was definitely the final nail in the coffin that Kojima probably wasn't staying at Konami. <laughs> yeah. I think that the worst part is it's such a poor judge of character. Like, Kojima has never been outspoken against Konami. He, he could have done anything for a really long amount of time. He could have said all sorts of stuff, even slyly, but he's always been a real pro about it. And... To think that, oh, you can't go on stage because who knows why. They're worried about what he might say or anything like that. It's just such a terrible judge of character and such a confusing decision. You know, there's just zero plus side to doing that. So whatever, Konami. Fuck Konami. Hashtag fuck Konami. <laughs> oh, my God, he said it. <laughs> uh, it's down. But uh, speaking of how he usually acts, did you see the tweet that he retweeted that, uh, that Yong tweeted at him? I did. That was pretty cool. That, that was glorious. For those that didn't see it, you know, Young pretty much said it was bullshit or d shit that Kojima couldn't go, and that was, like, an immediate retweet. And, like, when I saw that, I was like, all right, so, yeah, that, that definitely happened. He's not happy about it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, it's such a shame. But, you know, it, it also adds longevity to the Metal Gear experience. You know, there will come a time in the future when maybe he's able to talk a bit more about what this has been like making the game, working with Konami, and or, even without having to be vindictive about it, you know, there's something to look forward to in future years. Obviously, he'll have more output. He's This isn't a guy who's going to stop making games. So um, the tr truth will out, I suppose. I think, yeah, whatever studio he ends up at. Like, I, I imagine especially if he's at a studio that gives him a lot of freedom and then he winds up, you know, working on another AAA game in the interviews leading up to it. Like, it's got to come out, like, oh, like, you you have more freedom here. Like, you know, like, how is this compared to working with Konami, yada, yada, yada. He doesn't speak officially a lot, but he's got a whole bunch of old blog posts talking about his, you know, creative process of lifestyle, how all these things work. There's interviews with him and other people who talk about what it's like working there. And the funny thing is, everything that's been published to date is... Uh, glowing praise for the creative environment that he's been working in. You, um, there's a couple of posts I like to link. One about the last days of Metal Gear Solid 2, which was by Jeff Keighley, which is I think where they met. A big, a big, big piece on the last few days of Metal Gear Solid 2, and talking about how they they just allowed to do what they like. And there's another piece on the making of those intro sequences in Metal Gear Solid 4. And um, they're talking about uh, like Logan, the com company that made them. But they also ask a few of the producers and the bigger higher ups at Konami about it. The, the author is saying, like, he asks questions about, you know, how do you apply for budget or 
get this stuff approved. And he's saying the the producer he's talking to just gave him a blank stare. He's like, didn't know what he meant. He's like, you know, like Konami, do they let you do the stuff? How do you ask for it? And he goes, no, no, they they know what we're doing. Like, they're fine with it. We just ask what we want and they give it to us. And this is even at Metal Gear Solid 4 level. Like, there's just no clash there at all. So if this is all true, something has happened in the last few years. But I heard, um, is it supposed to be the guy who ran Konami, his son's in charge now and he's shaking shit up, but now we're getting into speculation and stuff again. Exactly. The only thing I can really, you know, speculate for myself or just assume, which, you know, I know it sounds bad just even starting off, just assuming something, like, obviously some kind of, like, political climate change there or, you know, under new management. Like, obviously there's a restructuring going on, so that's going to change a hell of a lot of things and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it, it's not hard to assume. Like, Konami obviously have changed direction. They're a company who wants to do whatever they think they're doing to keep up with the times, and we all know the whole mobile pachinko stuff that goes around, but yeah, they change direction, and it's just, I guess, a clash with an older style of doing it, and that's the way things are, but I'm sure we will see new games from Kojima in the future. Speaking of new games and stuff, uh, we know that Konami is going to go ahead and press forward with Metal Gear Solid without Kojima. I know we've talked a little bit about that before, and you know, obviously we're going to buy it. That's I mean, that's a far foregone conclusion. How much would you look forward to it? Oh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> I guess um, it, we'd kind of have to know what's coming. Yeah, I mean, I was blown away when Minigus Solid 5 was announced. Like, you have no idea. Like, I was quite happy at peace at terms the fact that Minigus Solid had finished. And that's even after the bonus prize of Peace Walker. So Absolutely. to hear about this, hear about this Minigus Solid 5 was a real shock to me. After that, Phantom, they talked about Ground Zeroes and then the first Phantom Pain trailer where I think most of us kind of knew what it was. That was crazy. I had to totally recalibrate everything because I thought I was done with Metal Gear Solid, well, done with new Metal Gear Solid. So I'm kind of at that point again, but it's a bit more definite knowing that the next one is not going to be a, a Kojima game. I mean, I play Metal Gear Solid because it's Kojima more than anything, like, yeah, it's got a cool story and cool characters, and it's got all that fluff around the background, and lots of people just love shit because of lore. That's never really been me. I play it because I'm going to get something made by Hideo Kojima, and he's going to do whatever he goddamn wants to mess with you and to show people what games are capable of still. So when I hear new Metal Gear Solid but no Hideo Kojima, I immediately start thinking about Assassin's Creed, and we've had this conversation before. Many times. I mean, especially since they have the the Fox engine already put together and stuff. Now they really do have the option to make it an annual release if they really wanted to. Like, I don't know if they have the, the kind of... Uh, not even annual release. Have. Even if you don't talk about annual releases, um, just the idea of taking, you know, oh, this has got a Metal Gear Solid story and stealth and, and these mechanics and stuff, but that heart and soul behind it that's constantly there trying to kick walls down and, and make a game that operates as a game before anything else, not some fucking B-grade character drama stapled onto the side of a stealth game. It's always been so much more than that. So without Kojima, I really have to question what it's going to be. But we know nothing. Hey, maybe they just want to throw together a new team and find a visionary director who will do his own thing with it and who will also toe the line when it comes to production. Who knows? So I would prefer that they found someone like with a completely different voice in the same way that Platinum did their very own take on Metal Gear Solid. That was far more interesting than having someone try to ape Metal Gear Solid or design it by committee or whatever. And that's a really good point, too. Like, I uh, I avoided Metal Gear Rising for the longest time, pretty much just because, you know, I had the idea, like, oh, it's not Metal Gear Solid, it's not part of the real story, yeah. And then, you know, when I finally picked it up, I kind of got over Like, it's not my favorite. Uh, I didn't like it as much as I hoped I would, but I was still, like, my expectations were still, you know, kind of broken a little bit. It's I have a weird relationship with Metal Gear Rising, obviously. Yeah, well, I mean, I... <sighs> It's going to seem like a weird thing to say. I mean, I don't consider it a Metal Gear Solid game, but I guess the more accurate way would be to put it is it's not in my little box of Hideo Kojima games. Sure, it shares a lot of Metal Gear Solid stuff, and it has characters and references, and it it does some similar things, but really it goes in my box of Platinum games. It, like I ranted about Vanquish a while ago, or even Bayonetta. They just do this awesome thing, and this happens to have a Metal Gear Solid skin on it and borrow some ideas about what they're trying to talk about. So, hey, that's cool. It's its own thing. What I would hope a new Metal Gear Solid 6, or whatever the hell they do, 
or my personal favourite would be Metal Gear colon Solid, just to mess with everybody trying to talk about <laughs> the games in the future. I hope it's it's its own thing, very much its own thing, possibly only tangentially connected by universe or whatever. But there's a lot of places to go. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, I'm assuming you're still going to buy it, though. Yeah, of course I am. I'm going <laughs> to give it a shot. And speaking I'll, I'll of, give it a uh, shot. even if it looks on. shit, even if it looks absolutely atrocious, like even if it looks like Transformers Four of Metal Gear Solid, I will <laughs> um, pick it up and give it a fair shake. But um, I will give it one go. I th- I hope it's either ex- like especially leading up to it, either look extremely polished and the story's great and it's got you know some really artistic draw to it, or it's completely just so shit. Like I, I either want either <laughs> either end of the spectrum. I don't want anything in between because if it's complete and utter shit, we'll get so much fun out of discussing it. That's very true. If we get the um, Star Wars Episode Two equivalent of Metal Gear Solid, then um, that could really be something. It'd be entertaining. That's really what I'm hoping for when I spend $60 is entertain me, and that would definitely fill that void. Yeah. The thing is, you're going to know straight away when they start releasing trailers. Like, perfect example here is, um, you remember that, that Konami released trailer about Metal Gear Solid Five? Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, at, <laughs> at, the, uh, at the E3, it was just awful. Yeah, and you can tell straight away that it's someone going, oh, how do we market Metal Gear Solid? You go, oh, here's what you do, and they drew up a checklist, and they put, yeah, it was Gamescom. Thanks, Jumo. Um, <laughs> what you do is you have characters narrating over the top, and you have action shots, and you have this or that and the other thing, and it just came out looking like balls. It was like uh, Michael Bay directed a Metal Gear Solid trailer. No, I disagree. Michael Bay is visually interesting. This trailer was crap. Um, <laughs> you hated it that much. Oh, I'm trying to think of who it would be, but I can't can't think of anyone bland enough lately. Whoever the fuck made, I don't know, Snow White and the Huntsman, whoever made that, if they made a trailer, that's what it would look like. And speaking of, uh, you know, I know we just mentioned Platinum a few minutes ago. This is kind of completely off topic. I know when we were talking about Metal Gear Rising before, <laughs> uh, we brought up that Platinum was making a Transformers game. Did you ever try that? Apparently it's out. Yeah, t- completely flew under my radar. I never got it. Oh, my God. It. Um, I'm going to go buy it. I heard nothing about it, and I don't want to hear anything about it. Um, I'm just going to go get it. But at the same time, shit, oh, I've got a backlog, eh? I've been just putting off buying or playing games because I'm playing Metal Gear Solid 5. Well, I'm just... I'm still in love with this game. I, I told myself I'd hurry up and get Fallout, like, just before or after Christmas. But the thing is, a Transformers game is going to take more time than Fallout, probably, because I'm going to want to sit down and play it on its hardest difficulty and... S rank everything and um, yeah, so I don't know anything about it, but I'm I was surprised to find out that it was out and that Platinum are already working on a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. I cannot wait for that. That's the big one that I'm waiting for. Is like another Nin- I mean Ninja Turtles games to me, anyways, have always actually been like some of my favorite games. Like even back on uh, I can't remember if it was PS2 or PS3, I had a really good side-scrolling uh, Ninja Turtles game that kind of went back to. Uh, you know, it was almost like an updated version of Turtles in Time from, like, way back in the day. I don't know if you ever played that, but that was, like, my favorite yeah, side-scroller. Yeah, we... I had a side-scroller on my Mega 500 that was the original arcade release, I think, which was before Turtles in Time. But, yeah, that was fucking good, and it was hard. Hell yeah, it was hard. So, um, yeah, I'm loving this Platinum picking up childhood titles and doing them a justice um, little shtick they've got going on, so that'd be one to keep an eye on. I, I want to see them do Jason the Wheeled Warriors, a platinum game that would rock hard. <laughs> I'm or Boss Master. That. Oh, shit. You know who I really want to see come back is Beautiful Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Although they kind of said everything they had to say with that game. It was really, really good. And then they managed to make another one. But, I mean, again, again this is platinum. I'm sure they can just crank it up to 11,000. But, um, <laughs> yeah, good call. Those are great games. Yeah, right on. And uh, we should probably bring it back to Metal Gear Solid here in a moment now that we're going off on a tangent again. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'm surprised we haven't really discussed that much is the character of Skullface. Yes. Um, I guess it's because it's impossible to bring up Skullface out of a billion drooling idiots going, Hoo! Um, <laughs> Fun fact, if you're listening, we've actually got a really effective filter in, in the... Oh, no, I shouldn't say anything, but I will, in the subreddit so that stupid-ass Skullface memes don't show up. So that's kind of fun. Thank you for that. Ah, you're welcome. Yeah, so Skullface... Um, Interesting character because we had a bit of context for him going into Metal Gear Solid, uh, into the Phantom Pain, from what we'd seen and heard in Ground Zeroes. That's very true, and I was actually uh, 
wow, robot scuff. Yeah, yeah, that was where I had a little bit of vapor in my mouth there from my e <laughs> uh, Um The microphone also made also went weird and made you sound like a robot. Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was actually uh, like that. I think just like the game itself, Metal Gear Solid Five. The more time that passes, the more I like Skullface. Because at first, I was kind of disappointed with what he turned out to be in Phantom Pain. Because there's all of these, you know, mystery and theories going on about the Ground Zeroes. You know, he quoted Big Boss all those times to Chico, and there's all these ideas like, oh, who could he be? He knows this about Big Boss. Was you know, like, is he his twin? Is he another clone? Is he decoy octopus? Is has he been alongside <laughs> Snake this whole time? And then it turned out later, like, during his big reveal, it's like, I'm the guy that followed you around and, like, cleaned up your dead bodies and shit. It's like, oh, you're, you're a glorified janitor. Yeah, um, it was a really interesting way to play him. I mean, you can talk about Skullface from a hundred different angles, but if we're going to go with that one, I I like it and I don't. Like, I mean, as an, on paper, it's kind of dumb. You've, they've got to insert this new character and say, well, actually, he was there all along in the background, and that's a that's a difficult task um, to pull off well. So that's an immediate obstacle. And I, I, there was a thread about it the other day about that the dagger that he got for Zero or something. I thought that was a really effective way of folding him into the history because he knows the stuff about Major Zero that we don't know, and they've got their own shit going on. So you, it makes it more believable and easier to accept that Skullface since was a person in this universe for a while and we, we just never came on stage before. So that that's fine. But I also find it weird that we get that kind of awesome level of character development way after he's like left the story. Absolutely, and I was just about to say, I think he was so much better in the tapes than he was in the cutscenes. I mean, in cutscenes, like, the whole time I was watching him, like, I was so let down, like, every time. I was like, this guy's ridiculous. Like, he's a complete clown. <laughs> like, every time uh, he shows up, he's just, like, <laughs> parading around. He's got more exaggerated, you know, hand gestures than Ocelot. He was the the subject of the, the most awkward car ride that ever happened. He... He did the who line delivery, and then, like, I was like, what the fuck was that? Like, this was the guy I was waiting so long for? And then, like, after I listened to, like, all of the tapes, and especially the secret tapes between him and Zero, I was like, oh, okay, well, he actually has a lot of depth. I just didn't see it until, you know, like, pretty much the end of the game. Yeah, he's a funny one. Um, I, I didn't mind him too much. Like, he was kind of a nice uh, flavoring throughout what was otherwise quite a serious... Uh, you know, story, serious tone, serious characters who are all pretty much just doing their business. And, um, yeah, and, and Chair mentions here, he seems so different as from the character we met in Ground Zeroes, and I do want to get onto that as well. But, um, no, I didn't mind him, his character and his, his vaudevillian nature because it was fun, it was neat, and I never really got bothered by the car ride. I... I came on the subreddit afterwards and the internet was straight up like, oh, the car ride was awful. And yeah, I mean, it was pretty shit, but it didn't really jump out at me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I just pulled out the iDroid and tried to play around for a while and just listened to him. And it's, it's a weird one to call. But he was very different from what he was set up in Ground Zeroes. Absolutely. I mean, in Ground Zeroes, he seemed like this mastermind, which I guess he was still in Phantom Pain, but like there seemed to be so much more... Like, I don't know, like, evil mastermind villain to him in Ground Zeroes, especially with how dark he went. Yeah, like, yeah, as we, we've got here in the chat, like, he's forcing children to have sex just to accomplish his goals, which he really didn't need to. It's, it's really weird. And the other thing is, in Ground Zeroes, he's building up to his objective. He's getting intel and wants to find Zero. And in the Phantom Pain, like, not only has he already accomplished that goal by the time we start the game, it's never mentioned until we've finished the game, and then we kind of get the other side of that. Yeah, it felt like kind of a weird tie-up, and like you know, at the end of the game, it's like, oh, by the way, Skullface went on to achieve all of his goals, and then you know, he made Sal like Sapholanthropus, and then the oh, yeah, not even that guys though. Like, like, he wants to find Zero. Like, where is Zero? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Zero. We're like, oh man, this is this guy's hardcore, and then he pops up in Phantom Pain and does this little thing. And then you find out afterwards that he'd already eliminated Zero. Like, this doesn't show up until the truth tapes. That his goal from... Then they show us how he accomplished his goal from Ground Zeroes. It's so strange. But I guess it's just a factor of, like, 
the Phantom Pain is really, really committed to non blah, 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 non-linear storytelling, and it just goes whole hog. It just the information shows up when appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> non blah 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 storytelling. <laughs> uh, the information show, information shows up um, when it's appropriate for you to know that information, and then you're just left to put all the pieces back together again. So it's strange, but that's the way it is. I think the nonlinear storytelling is actually like a really good point because I mean, one of the most important things in the character in any work of fiction is his motivation. And you know, like I noticed like straight off the bat, you know, before I knew that. You know, he had already eliminated Zero, and that's why, you know, Zero now couldn't be found. But, uh, you know, in Ground Zero, like you said, like, his main motivation was finding Zero, and then all of a sudden in Phantom Pain, you know, you see him again, and, like, when I first met him, I was like, okay, he's trying to find Zero. Then all of a sudden, like, this other crazy shit happens, and he's like, no, I'm actually trying to wipe English off the, like, the face of the Earth. I'm like, oh, shit. Well, that's even worse, but shit, when did that happen? Yeah, and the other weird thing about that is that we already knew his plan from the trailers, but the game tries to give you a fake out for a moment. Like when you rescue Skullface, like Kaz butts in. Sorry, Kaz butts in. He's like, oh my god, boss, he wants to wipe out every language except for English. But if you've seen the trailer, you already go, no, shut up, Kaz. That's not what's happening. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was really weird. I never thought I would regret watching the trailers for a Metal Gear Solid trailer. Because, I mean, like, even when people popped into the sub saying, you know, like, oh, I'm avoiding the trailer because I don't want to, you know, spoil anything for myself, a lot of people, including myself, be like, oh, it's like uh, yeah, it's Kojima too. directed. Like, he's not going to, you know, like, this is all, like, part of it. Like, he doesn't want you to know anything. And then, like, at the end of the game, I was like, oh, I knew pretty much everything. Yeah, I think if we didn't know about, so if we didn't specifically know about the the words, the words, his goal, then it would have been much more interesting to follow. But because we kind of knew that already, then as these things are popping up about killing people who speak certain languages, it's like, oh, okay, I, I know the end point of this. So that was really strange. Yeah, I thought so too. I mean, like, it was still, like, really good storytelling. And uh, like we talked about, it was either the last episode or the one before, just, like, how interesting of a concept that is. You know, like, eliminating our language is, like, such a powerful force in the world. And, I mean, that, that was, like, in his eyes, you know, like, to quote us a lot, like, that's, like, the biggest thing in the world that was, like, causing a problem to him was, like, the English language. And it was creating this giant uh, globalization, you know, like, well, the true. Like, that's what's happening in real life. Absolutely. Um, and I think <clears throat> that is one of the best parts of the game is this is like the sci-fi video game, you know, equivalent of Noam Chomsky. Like, this is having, going for the big stuff. This is really getting down to the nitty-gritty of the problems and what's causing issues in, like, global society. And that is Western cultural imperialism. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, like, even when I was taking my classes at school, like, there was all these, like, I had to take a class about, like, international business and being like, yo, like, this is becoming, like, a huge problem. Like, here's how you should like, conduct yourself and, like, yada, yada, yada. And, like, this how far, like, thing. Because, I mean, English is the language of business. And hmm. if, you wanna, if you want to take part in the system, then you need to speak English. Yeah, and, exactly. And that changes the way you think. Um, as, as Skullface kind of starts to touch on, you know, changing your language will change the way you think. You can no longer express certain concepts, you know, however subtly we're talking about it. The language you speak and the words you speak change the way you think because how can you think of an idea if you haven't got a word for it? And the interesting thing, too, is, like, they actually say that, like, uh, like with all this happening, especially with English, that, like, when you learn, like, English as a language, as a second language, and, like, you start to use it, like, so much in business that, like, your internal monologue actually, like, switches to English sometimes, like, when you're thinking about, like, those kind of things. Yeah, exactly. And then suddenly you're d talking about business within the concept of what is basically Western thinking, Western morals, Western values. It's a interesting rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, absolutely, and it's not even, you know, just business and everything, like media, like movies and stuff, like you look in uh, a lot of Asian countries, like things like 24 are like huge in Japan, like Kiefer Sutherland and like Bruce Willis and Tommy Lee Jones are like giant stars over there, I mean like when you look at most of their films, they're like so Americanized and so westernized, like e even in a show like 24, which is pretty much just like action and shooting and explosions, that is like so western culture. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, through entertainment, through video games, we, which is interesting in itself how Western um, Kojima kind of flavors his games, even though he, I would 
not knowing too much about it, I would say he has a pretty Japanese voice culturally, um, the way he deals with stuff and, you know, character design and all that kind of thing. He still really has a Western flavor to what he's doing, which is interesting in itself as well. He's, he's much more interested in that side of things. I remember when I was talking to, when I was at my last job, my assistant manager about Metal Gear Solid, and he was like, oh, I've never been a fan of that series, and like we we're kind of going back and forth, and he finally said, he's like, oh, it's a Japanese take on a Western movie, James Bond. I opened my mouth to retaliate. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, shit, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't see how anyone could ever consider that a bad thing, though. I mean, that's fucking amazing. That's, that's yeah. half the fun. Absolutely, and it's, like, so interesting. I mean, like, even take away the story, take away the gameplay, take away even, like, Kojima's fourth wall breaking, like, just to see, like, that kind of, like, cultural overlap is just more yeah. of, like, the more interesting things about the series. Because, I mean, like, that's a spot-on uh, description of Metal Gear Solid. It really is a, a, a an Eastern take on a Western, you know, story. I mean, we see James Bond well, Not just story, though. Like, think of what, you know, spy thrillers are always about Western politics and you know, post-Cold War stuff and American intelligence and superiority and all that kind of stuff. So a Western take on on the media that is spawned from that attitude is freaking interesting. Uh, that's why I was going on about Vanquish ages ago as well. It's like a Japanese take on, like, Gears of War, on that, that style of gameplay where Gear, Gears of War is more like American football. You know, it's just about yardage. You're a big, muscly man trying to move forwards and... Then you get to a baseline and have a shootout and try and move forwards again, whereas Vanquish is basically soccer, um, a completely different approach, but translated through firefights. Um, I love that kind of thing, uh, seeing a different cultural take on what is otherwise a different culture's touchstones. So, yeah, it's always been a lot of fun. Absolutely, and I think like the interesting part about that is, is like that's totally the kind of thing that I think made Skullface worry. Is that like you have like all this cultural overlapping and you know like not necessarily crossovers like we were just talking about like Metal Gear Solid and uh, that oh, game. Oh, dis- but... displacement though. Yeah, like it's, it's it's interesting that once again he's the villain and he's pointing out like one of the most fundamental truths of like global politics and he's fighting against it, saying this this Western culture is is just destroying everything and, and you know glo- globalization is just flattening everything out into one one way of thinking. And the interesting thing about that is, uh, like we've talked about before, that it's like while it is like kind of weird that it's just like this kind of character that just came out of nowhere, and now he's supposed to be like a cemented part of the story. Uh, he claims to be working towards what he envisions the boss's will to be, which at first, like I, I didn't, I'm not going to say take offense because that's you know, a little bit dramatic. But, like, I did find it kind of weird. I was like, what, this guy that just, like, came out of nowhere and just screamed who? Like, he's another guy that, you know, claims to know what the boss wanted. But, I mean, would globalization, like, the spread of the English language not be, like, a kind of unified world that, like, you know, the boss is looking exactly. for? Exactly. Well, I mean, that's, that's Zero's goal, isn't it? Like, Zero wants to spread Western culture across the whole planet. Like, that's, that's, the, that's what the Patriots are doing, because once you have that singular culture, then you're eliminating a lot of sources of conflict. That's exactly what's going on. Zero's goal, and he even talks about it in one of his tapes, and how he dismisses this parasite thing and goes, "Well, we're not we're not going to kill people. We're going to we're going to make them want to do it. We're going to make everybody want to become part of this global English society where everybody's culturally the same. But you know, by motivating them, you know, it doesn't you can't force people into this stuff. Uh, you know, Raiden was only a good test object because he wanted to be Solar Snake." There's a difference from forcing someone to be Solar Snake, you know, if we look at that as a, a test case later on. So, yeah, you know, you're dead right. Um, that is Zero's interpretation of the boss's will, like one culture, no borders. And it is like, it's really, like, I think that's like the thing I take home from Metal Gear Solid, you know, not like the main message or anything, but there was one goal that they're all working towards, and it was the boss's goal of, like, a unified world. But that's really all that she left them, was that she envisioned a unified world. And, like, just so many different interpretations of, you know, what that could mean or what paths to take to get there. That's really, I think, my favorite part of the series, honestly, to tell you the truth, is, like, out of all of Metal Gear Solid, the most interesting thing to me is that, you know, everyone really is working towards this one singular goal. But, you know, there's so many different roads to take there. You know, which one is truly, like, the best one? Or what would you say is, like, the hero's path to that? Yeah, especially... Well, she does articulate it a tiny bit. Like, she talks specifically about there being no borders. And Zero kind of seems to see that as drawing, or well, one border, really, a border around the whole world and saying everybody is in here and we're going to 
force everyone into this box. Whereas Big Boss sees no borders in a really different way and doesn't really see it as no conflict, but rather no bullshit. It's really hard to get into his stuff, but yeah, I'm not going to go too far off. Damn it, I had something I was going to say. <laughs> Zero again. I forgot it. I think Big Boss is probably like the hardest egg to crack out of all that because like it's the hardest to wrap your mind around like what his motives toward like a unified world are because he pretty much just runs an army of mercenaries. Well, I think his unified world kind of disappeared. Like his his goal changed to fighting Zero in a huge way. But oh, that's what I was going to say because if you look at Operation Snake Eater, the boss's goal was to bring the legacy back to the American philosophers so that one side would win and then end the conflict. So if you look at that from the perspective of Metal Gear Solid V, where it's the same deal, like, let's just cover the whole world in English, Western culture, so that we haven't got the shit going on anymore. That's actually incredibly similar to what the bosses, or to why the boss took a suicide mission. I think that's like, it's, uh, I've always wrestled with that one kind of myself. Like, did she really, like, want the Americans to have, you know, the legacy? Like, was that truly what she wanted, like, in her heart? Or Seems like was it. that just her mission and she was loyal to the mission? Going from context, I think she actually wanted to... She she believed in the mission as well, and the mission being to take on this mission that would end all the conflict, that would finally put one side at the win and shut down the other sides, which in, in the long game, I guess it kind of happened. But in that sense, you're saying, well, okay, then the, whatever it is the American philosophers stand for is now going to dominate the world. That's true, but I mean, like, it could also be spun that she felt that the Americans... Well, the, the American philosophers would have, you know, like maybe the most pious intentions, or you know, have the best, you know, result of reaching a unified world. Because I mean, like a unified world was like that's all that we really know is that 100 percent, like that was her final goal. It was like when she saw space, she saw the world without conflict, without borders. You know, she just saw yeah. one whole thing. Well, no artificial borders, hey, eh? no social borders, no lines on a map. Right. Um, yeah. No, arbitrary distinctions between people, and I think that's kind of a little bit where Zero's vision goes a bit crazy. Do you think that anyone had her intentions like completely in line? Well, I think, as you say, the intentions are there, but no one really knew what her methods were. So it's hard to say who had her methods correct, because we don't know what they were either. I know it's kind of a tired, almost meme at this point, but I think maybe Solid Snake at least came the closest, you know, not necessarily to her methods, but, uh, you know, like, kind of Attitude. fighting for the same kind of thing. Right, exactly. Oh, I agree entirely. In fact, if you look up on the wiki page, it'll link you to a source. Was something I only found out really recently was that the boss was meant to have... I think we were talking about this before, with Waylander, possibly. The boss was meant to have a blue and grey sneaking suit, the same colours as Solid Snakes, and they went in a different direction and gave her the, the pure white, which I think is equally effective, and I like it. But it's very interesting that an initial idea was to connect her to Solid Snake. <clears throat> oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. So, um, no, I, I agree with people who talk about that. I think that Solid Snake really did epitomize the boss's attitude or approach, possibly due to the fact that he had, not due to the fact, but he had no idea really of her will or who she was or what she did. He wasn't trying to emulate it. He did have that same approach, <clears throat> from how, however he whatever made him think of that, and that's probably what made it the closest to the bosses, even though it was unintentional, or possibly because there was that lack of intention there to cloud him and go, no, 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 this is this is right. We've got to do this because she said that. That's true. Do you think she knew, or he maybe knew about who she was? Because I mean, like I remember a lot of uh, Snake Eater was released to the public, but at the same time, like, I don't know how much of like the boss's involvement of that would have been released to the public. I suspect not. Um. I'm going to go ahead and say no, and I'm going to knew who she was. Which is kind of interesting, because, I mean, like, he's, like, her prod prodigal grandson, and, I mean, like like you said, like, after all is said and done, like, he's got to have come the closest. Yeah, for sure. And I think maybe an interesting part of that is he wasn't consciously trying to follow something that he thought was set in stone. Um, and as yeah, Shumo's pointing out, you know, just to let the world be. He doesn't go out to create systems or challenge systems. He goes out to correct injustices on a relatively small scale. You know, Metal Gears are spreading. Right? We've got to go shut down Metal Gears. There's less of this, oh, but 
what if Metal Gears are actually creating stability and what if they're doing this or that or the other thing? Solid Snake knows that Metal Gear is bad news. Like, there's no justifying it, really. There's no real good excuse for having this thing. So he goes and he takes them down. That's just what he does. Instead of um, trying to... And to a lesser extent, they're trying to engage in, like, the systems of the media, you know, publicize them, take photos of them, um, that kind of thing. But really, he just gets off his chuff and goes out and does it and says, look, these are these things are bad business. I know that to be a fact from my personal experience, and that is what my goal is. Kind of a different story when it comes to Liquid, when Camel goes to go, hey, we're going to get you kill Liquid, and Snake's like, well, I know this is a straight-up assassination, and I'm pretty sure he's aware it's probably coming from the Patriots, I, would, I think. But either way, he knows that Liquid's bad news, so he goes and does it. He's not doing it for the paycheck. Which I think is like a really interesting point, because, I mean, at this point, we can be pretty much sure that he did come the closest, and like you said, like he just knew that these things were bad news, so he went for it. I think it's really ironic that pretty much in every game that he was in, he was acting pretty much exactly how the Patriots wanted them to. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's, you know, that's Metal Gear Solid in a nutshell. There's a, a system operating around you, and if you don't stop and question why that system is asking you to go and complete Objective A, then you go and do it. It shouldn't come as a surprise when there's some weird motivation going on behind you. But yeah, he's a Patriot stooge, and nothing much changes even when he becomes aware of that. Which I think is still, like, kind of hilarious, because, I mean, like, at the end of the day, like, you know, Solid Snake had his own motivations, the Patriots had their own motivations, which, you know, they kind of spun wildly out of control from Zeros, but, you know, it was kind of weird to me, like, how many objectives lined up between Solid Snake and the Patriots, because, I mean, everything he was doing, like, he believed in, like, he wasn't manipulated to believe those things, like, that's legitimately just the way he thought. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's an interesting one to approach that way, eh? Like, he went to expose the Metal Gears and, and the Tanker mission, right? Yeah. And that was them trying to use, using the media to further their cause, but I think they kind of underestimated how much control the Patriots really had over the media, and they very quickly turned that around and used it to publicize them as a, as a terrorist. They just happened, because the, that's what Patriots do, they, they take what you want and they spin an elaborate thing around it to turn that into what they want. And, you know, the series is packed full of examples of that. So it's not that they both... Not that they wanted Snake to go and publicize photos of Metal Gears. It's just they realized he was going to be there or they baited him into being there. He used his own intentions against him. And then that's, of course, how Ocelot takes them down in Metal Gear Solid 4. Speaking of, like, uh, yeah, like, with all that included, like, uh... Ocelot is the, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little drunk here. Maybe we should call it a day. <laughs> here, we can just edit this part out. But uh, Ocelot has been in more games than anyone else. Do you think that he was working towards, uh, like, the boss's will or, like, in his own mind, you know, like, the world he was trying to create or she was trying to create or what do you think his I motivations think so. were? No, I think so. I think he's obviously loyal to Big Boss and part of that loyalty to Big Boss is being loyal to what Big Boss wants, which is... Creating, recreating the boss as well. Right I think on. That stacks up, stacks up pretty well. Um, so to bring it all back to Skull Face, he thought he was creating bosses will when really he was kind of the opposite, just wanting to kill everybody. But yeah, I was the same as you when he said that. It's like I am creating the true bosses will. Like that's probably the first time a Metal Gear Solid villain has said something, and I've just gone bullshit. <laughs> there are sorry, issues with sorry, just with the way Skull Face fits and everything, like. My complaint is his first, his first appearance, like at the end of Where Do the Bees Sleep, and he shows up and he's got Big Boss, like held upside down in a giant robot arm. Big Boss's, uh, sorry, Skullface's, the first step of Skullface's plan was to kill Big Boss, and then he finds out that Big Boss is alive, so he sends his top assassin and um, like a full-on hit squad to kill him, and he gets away. And then he sends his elite skull unit to ambush Snake while he goes to rescue cars to kill him, and yet Snake survives from that from that skull unit. And then Skullface has Big Boss captured, hung up and down, upside down, right in front of him, and says, I doubt you know the bigger picture. And then goes, now you will die. And instead of putting a bullet through his head, he leaves him to fight the unit that he's already a survived an attack from once. <laughs> that makes no sense. He has every reason to kill him. And it's the first Metal Gear Solid villain where that shit makes no sense. Like, all the others have really good excuses for why they do these bad guy tropes. 
and they seem like bad bad guy tropes at the time, and then as you get the bigger picture, you realise, oh well, actually, you know, Liquid needed Snake to activate Rex, or um, you know, the boss needed Solid, uh, Naked Snake to be able to kill her, or whatever. I mean, even Mega Soul Two, Solidus tries to kill Raiden pretty much every chance he gets, and it's other people who needed Raiden alive, and they ensure that. Does Volgan? Oh yeah, Volgan's nuts. He yeah, he doesn't have an excuse. He should have killed Snake. <laughs> ah, but he, he did need to reverse interrogate him. Yeah, Skull, Skullface had no reason to let Snake live. And instead, he, self-aware, like Murder Gear Solid self-aware, says, oh, well, I guess you just never see the bigger picture. And you sit there and going, ah, so the reason I'm being left alive, there's a bigger picture going on here, and there is none. So I thought that was a really odd introduction for a character who was so fucking cool in Ground Zeroes. Yeah, I was just about to say, like, he's, like he suffered from, like, all these, like, James Bond, like, classic tropes. I mean, like, even without, like, this Anthropus thing where he was, like, leaving him there hanging, like, going back to, like, House of the Devil where uh, he sees Big Boss there and, like, he has his, you know, little twin-barreled gun, like, pointed right at him. He's like, oh, it's you. I'm gonna set fire to this building and leave. <laughs> You'll surely die here. And, like, he... It was just like in uh, Austin Powers when uh, Dr. Evil leaves Austin Powers like dangling above like the sharks like tied up to the pole or whatever. And he's like, well, now I'm going to yeah. close these doors and just assume that you die. Yeah, and, and every other game is an excuse for it, but Skullface doesn't have one. Um, I'm just going to quote Cheerful Toe here. What are you here for? You're after the Philosopher's Legacy, aren't you? Admit it! We're after the location of the Legacy! The secret fund established by the three great powers during the two world wars. That's what you're looking for, isn't it? One hundred billion dollars! Divided up and hidden all over the world! And you're looking for a record of where all that money is hidden, right? No matter. The Philosopher's Legacy is safely in my possession. In the underground vault of Groznikrat. You're going to found a private army in ten years after killing the boss in an attempt to fulfill her will, aren't you? What is the philosopher's legacy? Well, let me explain. It's exactly how that reverse interrogation goes. <laughs> exactly. And, like, it's always the same line, too, whether it be a Bond movie or, like, a parody or Metal Gear Solid 3. Where it's like, oh, well, if this is the last thing you want to hear before you die, here's all of my elaborately laid plans just in case you escape. They'll be of great use to you. Yeah, and Metal Gear Solid normally subverts that a fair amount. Like, the boss has a really good reason to tell Snake what's going on because she needs him to kill her. It's a great, great reversal. Even Solidus tells Raiden what's going on. He goes, because now I'm going to cut your head open and get the nanomachines out of your brain because I need them. Um, and then he proceeds to go to town on Raiden. The, the games have always ducked around those tropes and, and have them make sense, I guess. But this one it just falls down in such a strange, sad way, which is a shame because I like Skullface as a character. And like you say, um, when you've got the whole... Yeah, by the way, I came to your parents. Because you've got the whole, um, what was I going to say? The non-linear story you're telling. You learn the big picture and it's amazing. But as you're progressing through it, it, it falls quite flat. In 5, absolutely. I mean, I think that, to me, was like the great tragedy of Skullface's character. Was that he was wonderfully acted and like he was theatrical. And like he really had potential. But in the end, like because of these like villain tropes and stuff, he just... Like, as a character, he kind of fell flat to me. Yeah, especially with even stuff set up in Ground Zeroes. You know, torturing the guy, show me your pain, tell me your pain, and all this stuff. And it's like, oh, this guy's really, really going somewhere with this. <clears throat> and you've got, like, other characters going, oh, are you a phantom too? And this is mysteryness being built up. But none of that ever really gets touched on again. And as we say, that his whole plot's resolved before the phantom pain even begins. Or his, his previous goals have all been resolved before the phantom began. Phantom, before the Phantom Pain even begins. And such shall be the tragedy of Skullface. Uh, we're running out of time here. We've got about three minutes left. Uh, before we go, we do have some stuff going around in the subreddit, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess it'll all be announced by now, but uh, by the time you hear this, listeners, I mean, not you, Scuff. I know I'm in New Zealand, but data travels pretty, pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> so we've got the mod elections on, as you may have heard. So when I was made a mod, however long ago that was, uh, that was in an election. Uh, Keller Zeit just had a vote and said, hey, it's up to you guys to you know, create the community you want, so vote in, nominate and vote, and I was lucky enough to get in, along with a couple of others. And then, since then, I think we've brought Wayland on once, just for pure um, last-minute shit. We need a little bit extra resources here when the game came out. 
And now we're at it again. We, I think that there's more posters and more submitters, and there's a little bit of inconsistency in, in removing basically the crap. You know, people who post pictures of staff and look at this glitch I found, or I made, I'm a, I've changed a bird for a dog, or that kind of stuff. Just the, the real low effort stuff that no one really needs to see. Um, we want some more consistency on that, as well as starting to build the community back up to how it was before a lot more, you know, good discussion, which is starting to pop up again on its own, which is a great thing. But it's just making room for it, making a good space for it is really the plan. So um, keep an eye out. Probably We'll probably announce the winners tomorrow, which will could be about a few days ago after you've heard this. So that's what we're going for. Right on. And, uh, you know, having been a person that's been here for a while, uh, I really do think that it is, like like you said, starting, like, discussions starting to pop up uh, a little bit more again, which is awesome. And uh, really, like, a sense of the community has always been my favorite part about uh, this subreddit. Like, even through, you know, like, the release has, you know, kind of skewed things a little bit. But even, you know, leading up to release, like, you recognize so many names. You get to know, like, so many people. And I remember, you know, like, back in the day, you saying that we were probably, like, the most unreddit subreddit, but we just kind of used the platform. Like, uh, that definitely always, like, kind of hit home to me. Like, this community has, like, always been great. And, you know, I hope that yeah, and is what you're trying to move back towards. For sure. And it's always had some decent standards, too. Um, I know a common complaint is that, oh, I'm going to solid hates theories, and they bash theories. It's like, no, they don't. They bash shit theories. They, they bash people making up crap and just talking about nothing. I mean, if you want to talk about fluff, there's plenty of places to do it, but people who come from other subreddits and from, like, gaming and go, oh, theory, 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 tend to take it really personally and take it the wrong way when people go, well, this, is, this isn't a theory. You just come up with an idea, like... There's no need to get on the defensive when someone just pokes a million holes in your thing and you go, well, oh, it's just a theory. It's like, you know, let's, let's raise the quality of, of our critical discussion here because it used to be really good. And there's no reason, I see no reason, to sit back and go, oh, you know what, just talk about stupid stuff because everybody else does it, so blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so there's no reason we can't have a really good critical discourse and there's no reason we can't have a bunch of fun, stupid, jokey topics that we used to without people getting the wrong idea. Right on, glad to hear it. Yeah, so that's my take. Obviously, it's only me and the whole mod team will all have input on that, and the community will have input on that. I just saw a post. What if Huey, dot, 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 <laughs> is hell? Like, he used parasites to fix his <laughs> spine and keep himself young, and he's secretly bad all along. You see, I don't... We don't want to remove that. Like, there's no reason a post like that should be removed, but I would like to get back to cultivating an atmosphere where people don't see the need to to make a post like that. And I think, like, my comment to, like, most of those, like, types of theories, like, what if Hal is Ocelot, like, my usual defense, like, stuff like that is, and, like, what can strike down, like, a lot of these, I'm just going to say it, like, stupid theories, is that, like, if something like that was that important, and I mean, like, Kojima was going into this knowing, like, regard, like, he probably didn't know he was going to be leaving the company or, like, you know, he thought he was going to be leaving under different circumstances. This was going to be the last game. If something was like as titanically important as that, <laughs> oh, Otacon is actually Hal, by the way. Like that's probably maybe going to get mentioned somewhere in the narrative at some point. Yeah, I mean, and that's the difference between you know a theory and an idea. Like anyone can have an idea, but you don't see me going on Reddit and posting every idea I have because otherwise I'd get arrested. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, there is, there's a, you can lift the state of discourse back to where it was, and um, everyone can get in on that because you do get to have there are plenty of places for dumb, fun discussions. But um, you know, flooding the front page is is maybe possibly not that place. <laughs> right on. All right, looking forward to it, man. I think we're about running out of time here, so we'll call it a night here. Yep, sounds good to me. Right on, man. Always a pleasure. Cool. Later on, mate.